Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all having a blessed day in the Lord. Welcome to another edition of the Shepherd's Herald. And I am the Shepherd's Herald, Pastor Eric Clemmy, uh, coming at you on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the gospel lesson from Mark at the 8th chapter, which will serve as the gospel for this coming Sunday, the second Sunday in Lent. And uh, let's hear what the Lord has to say to us today. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, Well, some say John the Baptist, but others say that you're Elijah, and others one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And then he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. So, what are we taking a look at here? We're looking at the confession of Christ as, well, the true Christ, the Son of the living God. He asked them that question. Who do people say I am? And some said that you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist reincarnated or Elijah reincarnated or you're one of the other prophets. But he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And that is a question that we're going to come across as a Christian. In our culture, in our society today, people may ask us, who do you say Jesus is? Why do you have this hope? Why do you believe the way you do? And we are to be prepared to give an answer when called on to do so, but when we do it, we'll do it that with gentleness and with respect. So who do people say Jesus is today? Maybe he's asking us today, who do people say that I am? Well, one of the things I hear amongst Christians now these days, evangelical Christians in particular, is that Jesus is a man's man. He's not just some kind of wussy carpenter. He's a bricklayer. He's a stonemason. He's a man. And he's going to be coming back to take names and bust some skulls. Ugh. Well, what's another thing that people may say Jesus is? Oh, they might think that he's like a great genie of the universe that grants everybody wishes. Like he's some kind of divine vending machine in the sky. And all you have to do is insert your prayers the way you would some money, press some buttons, and out you're going to get whatever you ask for. Some think he's just all loving, tolerant, and a non-judgmental savior. But we know that he's coming back to judge the living and the dead. Now there's got to be a fine balance between the man's man and this judge that's coming back. Others believe that he is a wrathful, vengeful God that has too many requirements and demands of pietism. You can't eat certain things. You can't drink. You can't smoke. You can't swear. You can't dance. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. All of these things. And they see him as a judgmental, perhaps even an angry, wrathful God. Still others see him as a guru, some sort of a teacher who taught good moral values. And then others still see him as a man we could trust and what we could cast our vote for. We could make a decision even though John 1, 14, 15, 16 says, we are born again, not of a husband's will, not of a man's decision, not of reason, but of the will of the Father and the Father alone. Not by anything that we can say or do. Others still think he's a guy who gets us. He's a guy who really just gets us. You see those commercials all the time. Again, he gets us. Well, yeah, but he doesn't just get us and leave us in the muck and the mire. He raises us up as well. So now what about us? 
we see a lot of people out there, a lot of even different Christians, having all these various ideas about who Jesus is and what he does and says and teaches and all this. But now, to his disciples, he asks, and he asks us today as well, but who do you say that I am? Well, if we say anything that was mentioned above, then we're in gross air. We're wrong. He's not a genie of the universe. He's not simply a man's man that lacks compassion or understanding or love for the greatest command he gives us is to love one another and to love those who hate us and persecute us and say all kinds of things falsely against us and to go out and to serve them, to give the shirt off our back, to turn the other cheek, to be meek and mild to go the extra mile, all of that kind of stuff, is part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian and diametrically opposed to the ways of this world. If we say anything that he is just more or less a guru, a teacher of good morals, then we miss the entire point because those good morals don't save us. It's not us doing salvation and working it out. It is because this is a fruit of faith, a result of the fact that we are already the saved and justified people of God in Jesus Christ by grace through faith apart from boasting works, but only in the works what Jesus has accomplished for us in his suffering, his death, and, and ultimately his resurrection. So who do we say Jesus is? Well, the only way we could say anything true is through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Matthew, we have a fuller account of what is taking place here. Same situation, same event, but a little bit fuller picture of what is happening. And of course, Peter is the very first one who speaks. Peter is always the first one to speak. He's kind of the loud mouth of the crew, isn't he? He's always, sometimes even, putting his foot in his mouth. Well, in Matthew, he asks them these same questions. They answer very much in the same way. But Peter says a little something extra. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Not just the Christ, but the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and this, is, this is what Jesus says in response that counters decision theology and everything else. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but only my Father who is in heaven. Only the Father revealed it to him. And then he goes on to predict his suffering and death, just like he does in Mark. I, I left that part out, and just focusing on those first few uh, verses there, but he, he, he predicts his death that he has to suffer, that he has to die, and that we too, if we want to follow after him, must suffer and die to ourselves and love and serve others and think better of others than we do even of ourselves, for that is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Peter says, no, 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 no way, Jose. We're not even going to go there. If you're going to Jerusalem to die, then go in the other direction. Then he chastises them in Matthew and also in Mark. Get behind me, Satan, for you no longer have the things of God in mind, but rather just the things of men. And he said this in front of his disciples. He knew his disciples were looking, that they were watching, that they were waiting to see what he was going to do and how he was going to say it. And he rebukes Peter. One moment Peter is confessing Jesus Christ as the Lord, as the Christ, as the Son of of the living God because the Father revealed it to him. But the next moment he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he starts having the things of a sinful man in mind and he's like, protect yourself, Jesus. Go, don't suffer, don't die. Go in the opposite direction. Let it be never ever happening to you, Lord. And he was a temptation to Jesus. He was a tool of Satan there. And he calls Satan out, get behind me, Satan. Not Peter as much as the temptation of the flesh, our weak flesh, that Satan uses to manipulate and twist us and twist the truth and get us to take our eyes off of the main purpose and goal like he was trying to do here with Jesus, 
Don't go to the cross. Don't suffer. Don't die for these people. They're not worth it. Save yourself. Head out of Dodge. Go to Tarshish. Go in the opposite direction. And Peter is then strongly rebuked. One moment he's got the mind of God. The next he's got the mind of Satan. And just sinful fallen men who all of us were bound to sin, to death, and the power of the devil itself. So, where do we go from here now? Who do we say Jesus is? We say and confess with Peter that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And flesh and blood has not revealed that to us either. There is no way that we could choose to accept him in and of ourselves by our own reason, power, thought, vote, whatever, because we're sinful and unclean. That is why Jesus came into our flesh to bear our sin, to be our Savior, to, to fulfill the law of God that we couldn't because we could not raise up to him. We could not come to him. We could not know him. We could not choose for him. Our will is bound. We have no free will. Not when it comes to this higher spiritual matters. Oh, we have free will about what kind of car we're going to drive and where we're going to work and what spouse we're going to marry and where we're going to live and all of those type of things. But when it comes to salvation, our will is bound. It is bound into slavery, to sin, to death, and the power of Satan himself. And that is why a Savior had to come into this world. For you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go bear fruit, fruit that will last, he says in John 15 and 16. We cannot choose him. So we confess as a fruit of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God, because faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God, as Paul says in Romans. We get this faith from the Holy Spirit. He instills it through the proclamation of this gospel into our minds and into our hearts. And then he enables us to open up our lips and to confess as Peter did, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And it is only forever and only through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that we could even begin to do that. But then Peter admonishes us that we should, in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16, be always ready to give an answer for the reason of the hope that we have inside of us when called on to do so. But when we do it, do it with gentleness and with respect, not like a banging gong or a clanging cymbal, beating people upside the head with the big old leather-bound floppy Bible and, and speaking truth but not love. And, and, and No, then we are in the way of the ultimate gospel of Jesus Christ. No, we do it with gentleness and with respect. So when people ask us who Jesus is, and they will ask us, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus to you? Why do you believe in Jesus? Or what do you think about heaven and hell? What are your thoughts on eternal life? Why do you believe in this Jesus? Why do you have this faith? Seems foolish. Seems like superstition, whatever the case might be. Peter encourages us to be always ready to give a reason when called on to do so. And then again, do that with gentleness, with respect. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts and minds through the efficacious means of grace of his word and enlightens us. And it's his words. Remember when Jesus sent out his disciples, he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. For my father will give you the words to say at the time. And they are not going to be your words. They're going to be his words. Not our words, but his words. So he wants us to be enlightened. He wants us to be mature. He wants us to be able to give a reason of why we believe, teach, and confess the way we do. I knew one woman whose son wants to come back to church. He's an older adult. He hasn't been in church in many years. And he has a lot of questions. And he's asking his mother, Mom, why do you believe the way you do? What are your thoughts about heaven and hell? What are your thoughts about an afterlife? What are your thoughts about church? Why do you go to church? What are your thoughts about Jesus? And you know what this woman says? 
says the same thing that many parents say, and even grandparents. I don't know. You better go ask the pastor. That is the worst possible thing that any supposed Christian could say. Your son or daughter does not want to hear from a pastor they don't know from Adam's house coat. They don't care about any of that or who is telling them. They want to know from you personally as their mother, as their father, as their grandparents. Why do you believe? What do you say about Jesus Christ? That's what influences them. And when they're asking you, they don't want to hear from somebody else. They don't want to hear from some stupid so-called expert. They don't care about that. What they care about and what they've always cared about, and because there's nothing new under the sun, this is why Peter says, everybody be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have inside of you and called on to do so and do it with gentleness and with respect because people want to know from you directly what do you believe, teach, confess about Jesus Christ. We don't pass them off. We don't pass the buck. I think many of our people are afraid because they might say the wrong thing. Remember, it's the Father who gives us the words when called on to do so. It's not our words. It's his words. And I look at this this woman, and many like her, and she's in church every single Sunday. She's in every Bible class. Most all her life. And she cannot answer her son's questions. She's too afraid to answer the questions. Maybe she's too embarrassed to answer the questions. But her son is seeking, asking, knocking. And that is a motivation only through the power of the Spirit. It reminds me of the idiot that James speaks of in James 1.23. In the classical definition of an idiot, an idiot is somebody who could not see outside of themselves. They perhaps may lack empathy for others. They may think the whole world revolves around them. They're kind of like morons. He said, a person who sits in church every Sunday and hears the word regularly, this is what James says in chapter 1, is like a man who studies himself and his features at length in a mirror and then turns away and immediately forgets what he looks like if he doesn't put it into practice. This mom was kind of that classic idiot. I don't know. You better ask the pastor. It breaks my heart because we are a royal priesthood of all believers in Jesus Christ. We are all saved by grace through faith in the works of Jesus Christ alone, and we could announce the forgiveness of sins to each other. We could give a reason for the hope that we have inside of ourselves when called on to do so. And we are that royal priesthood that declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And that's what it means to do the mission and ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ, the mission and ministry that he gave us. We love and serve all people. And we are ready to give a confession that Jesus Christ is the Lord, the Son of the living God. And we only do that through the powers of the Holy Spirit coming into our hearts and minds through the efficacious means of word and sacrament. In baptism, we have been marked as ones redeemed by Jesus Christ the crucified in water and word. In our, the Lord's Supper, we are nourished in his body and his blood. We are given a foretaste of the feast to come. We are given assurance that our sins are forgiven. And through the word, we're equipped for every good work. Every good work. Every good work. And we go out there and we fulfill that command of love. A new command I give you, and he gave this command on Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday is the Thursday of Holy Week. It is the night that he was betrayed and handed over to the Sanhedrin and to Pilate to be condemned and judged to death. 
a new command, and monday means mandates, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so also must you love one another. All people will know you are my disciples by your love for each other, not by your slander, not by the backstabbing, not by the gossiping, not by the petty piety, not by arrogance, not by self-righteous, or not by saying, go ask the pastor. It is in us by grace through faith. And as a fruit of that faith, a result of the fact that we are the justified ones of God in Jesus Christ, we could boldly declare and open up our lips and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of the living God, that we are saved by grace, through faith, apart from boasting works, as we see in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And yet we are called to, as God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that were created beforehand that we should walk in them every single moment of every single day as a fruit of faith. As though well, first we're justified and then we're sanctified. We are then made holy and set apart from. So when we go out and we love and we serve and we confess with gentleness and with respect who Jesus is, we expect nothing in return. It's not an evangelical tool that we use to try to manipulate people to come into our fellowship and be just like us. We don't have any power to change hearts and minds. Only God and God alone through the power of his word has that authority and ability to change hearts and minds and instill saving faith in people, not us. So it's not some kind of evangelistic tool or outreach tool that we use. We're going to love and serve you, but we really want you to just come and join us. That may be a desire that we have, but that is not what we expect. We meet people where they are at just as our Lord Jesus Christ came down and met us where we are at. And he asks nothing in return. We respond to his love. We respond to his grace. We respond to his word through the teacher, the counselor, the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit, the one who is with us always, even until the very end of the age. And that is how we are able to give a reason for the hope that we have inside of us when called on to do so with gentleness and respect. When people ask us, when they ask you, who do you say Jesus is? We can, through the power of God's Spirit, say, Jesus Christ is Lord, the Son of the living God. Amen. And now I'm going to play for you hymn number 420 out of the Lutheran service book, the LSB, Christ, the life of all the living. And indeed, Christ is the life of all the living. And I'm going to play at least the first four uh, verses if you have, if you're a member of Lamb of God or a Lutheran, Missouri Synod Lutheran in particular, please take out your hymnals, your L the LSB, the Lutheran service book, and open up to 420. I'll read that first verse at least. Christ, the life of all the living, Christ, the death of death our foe, who thyself for me once giving to the darkest depths of woe, through thy sufferings, death and merit, I eternal life inherit. Thousand, thousand thanks to be Dearest Jesus, Lord, to thee, thou, O oh, thou, hast taken on thee bonds and stripes, a cruel rod, pain and scorn were heaped upon thee. O oh, thou sinless Son of God, thou didst, thus didst thou my soul deliver from the bonds of sin forever. Again, a thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus unto thee, thee, for truly it's all about Jesus, not about us, it's about Jesus, what he has done, what he is doing, what he continues to do for us until the day of his return, the culmination and consummation of everything we hope for, long for, believe, teach, confess the truth that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. So here we go, uh, Christ the life of all the living.
your heads in a word of prayer with me. Lord God, our loving Heavenly Father, you have revealed your Son, Jesus Christ, through us, through your own means of grace, that he is your Son. In him you are indeed well pleased, and we are to listen to him. Lord, we pray that your spirit will be poured out into our hearts and into our minds and open up the eyes of our hearts so we may see you, we may know you better, that we may live the lives that you have called us to. Revive us, revive us, O Lord, Lord, break us and revive us, shape us and lead us in the way that we should go so that we can be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have inside of us when called on to do so. We ourselves, not pointing them to the pastor or a teacher or anybody else, but we ourselves can give that reason. And when we do it, let us do it as you've done it for us with gentleness and with respect as our suffering servant. Lord, keep our hearts and minds focused on your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now have a blessed rest of the day in the Lord, everyone. And remember, um, tomorrow, Wednesday, we have Holden Evening Prayer at 6 o'clock. We have Stations of the Cross from uh, 9 o'clock all the way through 7 o'clock. That, at, that evening. Uh, you could come anytime in the morning or the afternoon or before service or stay after service and do your stations. And um, also our worship service on Sunday, Divine Service, is at 8 and 1030 with a Bible cl class at 915. All are welcome. Come as you are. Just come and be fed with the means of grace. Let the Holy Spirit enlighten your hearts and your minds. And Lord, we just, just be with us always. And always, we pray this always, deliver us from the power of the evil one. Have a great rest of the day in the Lord, everyone. Oh, by the way, our address here is 57210 Allen Road in Slidell, Louisiana, 70461. Um, we'd love to see you. Have a blessed rest of the day.